talking about our knowledge organization infrastructure uh, that we've been working on for the past couple of months. Um, so go through like the, I guess I'll just show the agenda here, uh, the, the goals for the project, the kind of design principles behind it, the theory and concepts that we developed um, kind of early in the summer, how that evolved into our protocol design, and finally the infrastructure that we have now, um, and then the interfaces we have into that, and then plans for the future. So yeah, I think the the goals here. This is uh this is the lightest slide by far. Um, which is yeah, is to to improve our actual uh knowledge organization knowledge organization infrastructure in in technical terms and things we're actually building, and along with that to kind of create better tools to to reason about these kinds of knowledge or knowledge systems in general and and the dynamics of those systems. Um, So I think one one way of looking at this and kind of in terms of the kind of uh, conceptual computing stack is that we have these we have these layers for you know data and modeling and computing, which are especially like now with web three and the P2P space and, and all of that, we're seeing a lot of good continuations of of that work. Um, some of it's happening in block science, like we've, we've got cats here. I, I'm sure CAD CAD could be fit into this as well. And then one way of looking at organization is um, that it's, it's, the, it's the slice of this that kind of permeates the, the stack that um, gives us affordances for, for organizing these things, right? For organizing our data and our models and our computation. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, and and we think that like RIDs and identity and, and relations and some of the some of this work is a good um, stab at some some really important aspects of what it means to make digital systems organizable. Cool. Uh, so then moving on to our design principles, um, a lot of this presentation is going to be kind of grouped into two sections. One is kind of regarding the RIDs and the objects, and the other is regarding the identities and the kind of groupings of those objects. Um, so that's also kind of reflected in our design principles here. Um, so the, the first two here um, refer to the RIDs that we've been talking about. Um, so the map and the territory are distinct, and we want to reference things rather than recreating them. And we have a, a quote from David here that when you look at a rock, you can't put the rock in your brain. Um, and that's something that's, that's come up um, when discussing RIDs and how we're thinking about information, um, where we're not we're not wanting to replicate kind of what we see in the real world in our own internal system, but we want to point to what already exists. Um, but an important aspect of that is realizing that these are two distinct things, and the internal representation we have is not the same as the the real world, the territory that we're mapping. Um, and so these two kind of principles go together and sort of led us in the direction um, of of the RID object system. Um, and then we have support plurality of perspectives um, and then no single source of truth. And these kind of go together, um, but essentially we want our system to be able to support people having different perspectives on the exact same things um, without forcing them to kind of achieve consensus or come to one conclusion um, and without kind of weighting certain perspectives over others as being more or less authoritative or important. Um, and obviously those things will naturally emerge. Um, but the base system itself shouldn't have any bias in that regard and should allow for um, the truth to, to emerge kind of subjectively based on the perspectives of the actors within the system rather than um, relying on some single source of truth from outside the system. Um, before we jump into this section, one one last thing on on that slide is that it, we want a plurality of, of perspectives from from people, um, but also pluralism in in terms of the organization itself. So an important part part of supporting a plural a plurality of perspectives is allowing things to be to be organized in a plurality of ways. And a lot of the systems that we have now. Um, they provide kind of affordances and uh, particular ways of organizing at the cost of um, other ways that we may want to organize them. I, I, I think we'll 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 come back to that. But yeah, 
Cool. So yeah, we'll go through a little bit of the kind of theoretical conceptual stuff here. That's I think important uh, for for informing what we've actually built and and understanding why we've built it and and why it works the way that it does. So the first one here um, is this this concept of, of digital objects, right? Here's some kind of very everyday examples like files or functions in a program or some calendar event or, or just a named place like Mount Everest. Um, and th these are the kind of the, the most basic organizational units of, of computing in a sense. And I uh, will we'll maybe to, yeah, we'll, we'll get to why we think that's true um, I think in the next slide. So yeah, the the thesis here is that uh, is that we we can we can articulate what objects are as as reference. Um, <clears throat> oh, actually, Luke, could you quickly um, reload these slides? I made some last minute uh, tweaks. Oh yeah, sorry about that. No, that's all good. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So objects are any digitally represented reference, um, and that could be a reference to data, to a piece of computation, but also to abstract concepts and things that are not themselves digital. Um, and so part of this thesis is that basically reference is both when and how data or information becomes distinct things that we are able to organize, express things about, and, and so on. So here's a, a visualization of, of that. This is from um, the digital objects piece, which hopefully will be published uh, this month. Um, that's pretty much all, all wrapped up. Um, and so you can imagine we have these kind of two abstract spaces. One is the space of all, of all uh, references or all things which refer, which are digitally represented. Then we've got life, the universe, and everything already, uh, the, the space of everything that you can refer to. Um, you could think of this as like the referent space where a referent is the thing you're referring to. Um, and when you're referring to something, uh, they can be entirely separate. They can they can overlap. Um, there are ways the reference can be ambiguous or different at the point of interpretation. Um, we won't go into like too much detail with that here, um, but I think this is a, more of like a, an image to help drive intuition of what we mean by by reference. So yeah, so so a reference is is really this this relation right between a, a reference, which is a thing which refers, and a referent, which is a, a thing referred to. So references could be anything from like names, URLs, database queries, CIDs, CSS selectors. Say again, David. Oh, sorry, I think that was in my. Oh, that was you. Okay. Um, and very importantly here, I think, is that the reference is is more than just addressing data. Um, so these digital objects include, you know, named concepts or places. Um, and so in in that sense, it's a, it's a much bigger space. It's, it's anything you can refer to from within a digital system. Cool. Uh, so next up. Oh, sorry. I think there's one last part for you. Yeah, one 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 last part here. Um, this is uh, again just to help drive intuition. Um, that depending on how you're referring to something and and what you're referring to, um, we can have different ways of disambiguating what it is. Right. So you can imagine that a CID quite robustly refers to a well-defined um, string of of binary, but for example, a person's name. Uh, has a lot more ambiguity, right? Because it depends on the context who you're actually referring to or if the person can can tell. And then in other cases, like if you're naming a place, people's interpretation of where that, of, of exactly what is included in, in that referent um, might overlap, but they are still um, distinct from one another. Cool. So the next section of uh, your identity. So now that we've defined what these digital objects are, um, and the referent and reference components. Um, the the next big conceptual concept that we, that we want to introduce is the identity. Um, and so the common meaning is just the sameness of things over time. Um, so me as a person, my body and thoughts and personality change over time. There's this continuity of me being the same person over my entire lifetime. Um, but then in the digital world, we have things like Google Docs, program variables, or immutable files. 
which all have a sense of uh, this continuity that even though the content and, and underlying data within them uh, changes, they're still referring to the same thing. Um, and so conceptually, we've sort of broken this down into these two axes of uh, temporal and spatial identity um, to kind of better understand how we can uh, design a protocol to represent um, the, the kind of breadth of identity that we want to. Um, so the first example we're going to go with is the ship of, C of Theseus, um, which is a, a very old kind of paradox. Um, we have this ship that kind of slowly breaks down and each piece is, is replaced over time. Um, and eventually none of the original pieces remain. Um, and so you have a ship that's made of completely new parts, but there is this continuity of the original ship and the new ship. Um, and so this is a, a, an example of temporal identity where even though the, the ship we started with and the ship that we ended um, could be considered completely different because they have completely different components because there's this continuity of how it changed over time, we could also consider it to be the same ship. Um, so then we have the spatial dimension. And so for this example, this is a, a satellite view of the, the city of Tokyo um, to kind of illustrate how we can group together different objects in different ways, um, but refer to them as the same thing. Um, so the, the city proper of Tokyo, which you can't see right here because this is just, there's just this urban sprawl, um, is, is kind of the most densely populated area. Um, but there's this larger kind of urban area, which which um, includes kind of nearby cities, which have become connected through this this urbanization. Um, and so there's lots of different ways that you could define what the city of Tokyo is, but they all refer to the the spatial dimension of it. Um, so between these two axes axes of, of temporal and spatial identity, um, we end up with this model of identity as agreement. Um, and so our kind of tagline here is intersubjective agreement on which things are actually the same thing. Um, so it's a social model and not a metaphysical one. And what we mean by this is that um, the identity of things is not sort of inherent. Um, a lot of it comes from what we observe in the real world, but in the end, it's it's a construct that we socially come to uh, through agreement. And again, going back to our, our previous discussion, this doesn't mean that um, we have to come to a single consensus and there can be multiple consensuses and multiple different perspectives on the same identity, um, but it's socially constructed as kind of a group. And so to come back to the, the ship of Theseus example, um, we can we can kind of re-articulate the, uh, the paradox that it poses as really uh, an identity question. And this um, identity as agreement model, what, what we're basically saying is that for the people on the ship, for example, they might agree among themselves that it's the same ship. But if you see, a, you know, a brown ship leave dock and come back a year and a ship appears a year later, that's, you know, purple with different colored sails, the people on the shore might might disagree and they, they might believe that it's a that it's a different ship. Um, and uh, another example of this would be in uh, when people are doing uh, research writing, right, and you, and you use a particular named concept, um, depending on the the kind of the context and and maybe how you you preface that work. The the actual kind of identity of of the words you're using can be different, um, and so we we can see the importance of identity in in research writing. Um, because people put a lot of care into disambiguating the particular meaning of the words that they're using, and that is essentially um, this this kind of you're, you're 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 making sure that people are able to point to the correct identity because um, that's not uh, just encoded in the words themselves. It's this socially constructed um, thing. So here's a little a little pause. If we've got kind of questions or uh, things to discuss. Um, my question is: As you've been developing this this notion of identity as agreement, how have you thought about um, comparing it and contrasting it with other notions of identity, both from a, like more philosophical perspective as well as from um, maybe a more computer science technical perspective? Um, sort of like 
coloring in the relationships between this model of the world and other ones that have been kind of operational in other contexts. Do you want to start there, Luke, or do you want me to go? Still thinking about it. If you have an answer, sure. go for it. <laughs> so, so let's see. One, one, one comparison here um, is is to where identity is is more commonly used in the context of computing, which is like the identity of of people or, or agents or, or, or actors. Um, and so, one way of looking at this is that we're trying to generalize the notion of of identity, right? Because the the identity of of people, and if you if you're mechanizing that, you're you, you are largely concerned with this same problem. It's not it's not the only thing, but you're you're in some sense mechanizing a way in which um, a particular person, or like for example, like collections of of actions that something is taking in a digital system you want to establish that like oh actually like all of these actions taken these were done by the same person um and most identity for for humans is is about kind of establishing yeah like the that you have this single entity that is able to do stuff in this digital world um but here we actually don't care about whether whether something with an identity is doing things, um, because it's it's also very important, like in the in the research writing example, that we can actually just kind of um, establish when when things are actually the the same concept. For example, um, in terms of like other philosophy, it was it, that was quite interesting to get into. Um, because and we'll come to this later when we when we formalize this a little bit more um but in philosophy it can sometimes be adequate to just say that like an identity is a relation that holds between a thing and itself um like you know five equals five that kind of stuff um but that's not as useful for what we want to do here because the reality is that like these things do actually change, right? Like the boards on the ship of Theseus and the sails get replaced. And so, or, or you know, a, a Google doc or, or some some mutable variable, um, the actual data there is also changing. Um, and so a kind of a direct uh, equivalence is, is kind of, inadequate to to express what we're trying to express here which is this kind of social construct of like oh actually these these things are really not not multiple things but they're really one thing um there's i guess some thoughts have, have you got things to add there luke yeah i think it's it's interesting you brought up like the the definition of a word in a paper here because i think that's actually super relevant in that the word identity can mean a lot of different things to different people and in, in, in a different context. So I think you identify a lot of the key ones here, but I think especially in computation, most people think of it as a way of identifying something. Um, it's like a UUID or a CID, um, which kind of connects back to our, to our RID things that we'll, we'll talk about more later. Um, but our kind of view of, of identity, I think is more holistic um, in that it's not just a way of referring to something, uh, but it's also a way of comparing it's it's sameness to other things uh both over time and space which is where that temporal and, and spatial uh dimension of it come from um and so i think a lot of the sort of philosophical perspectives on identity uh, as orion mentioned are not as useful in like a, a practical context um so the, the two dimensions that we've established give us like a pretty wide breadth in what we can um represent using this system um, so I, th I think that ends up being a lot more useful for the types of relationships we want to uh, represent and be able to kind of operate on between the uh, the digital objects. You got any other thoughts or questions? Just one 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 quick question on uh, on following up on identity a little bit. Maybe this is either true earlier or not not applicable. Is whether or not the transitivity of identity is something that would be useful explicitly or is it downplayed or is it is it explicitly you know withheld in the sense that you you know if one thing seems identical to something else that it becomes a chain that you can actually progress to get further and further away sort of building that that the ship of theseus like across different types of objects that are that are explicitly delineated and mm -hmm. they're thereby making like an like an equivalence class kind of a of an argument but um yeah yeah i'm just curious I, 
I think I think that's a great question. Um, uh, it's definitely one that I thought about a lot. I haven't. I I suspect that there is no good single answer there, given the kind of like holistic and very generalized nature of the kind of identity we're talking about. But um, I will loop back to that when we talk about like a more formal way of of expressing this and one equivalence class that that formalism produces. Um, cool. Which 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 might might. Uh, might answer that question or, or at least partially. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I think this may be a little bit of a cop out, but could also be answered by the kind of plurality of perspectives that we talked about in the design principles um, and that we're kind of opening it up for any kind of agent in the system to assert their own beliefs on what identities exist between these objects. Um, so it could, it could totally be valid to, to use that um, transitive property to kind of show the equivalence between two things which are not really equivalent, but that's just you know one potential perspective on the state of the system, um, and, an, and another agent might not see that um, that kind of chain of of identities as really being um, a valid like equivalency between two objects. I think um, it's probably worth noting that in the discussions and development of these concepts, we've also talked about the the negatives, like the the non equivalences. I, I think this is important because we are not getting a system that is consistent it can cohere but it's not it's actually inconsistent by design as weird as that might sound um the <laughs> the um the the window discussions that emanated from many people who visited albany um sort of were a demonstration of the way in which the different um discriminators for the notion window resolved to different decisions about whether or not a particular object satisfied that so you would get potentially inconsistent claims um directly from there's the notion of window and then that is some very abstract referent and then you get um, the relationship between the notion of window and a particular discriminator or definition of a window. And then you get relationships between those different definitions and the specific instance of the object being labeled. And so when you think about it from a consistency standpoint, that split between the, the relationship between the notion of you know, the word window and what it means, two different discriminators, both of which could be considered discriminators for window, and then applying them each to that window and getting a different bit back, yes or no. You get get an example of an inconsistency in some sense that if you try to trace back to is this or is this not a window, you get a disagreement. And it's interesting because it's kind of a very formal way of expressing paradoxes in general, is that you almost always get paradoxes from some sort of missing link in the logical chain. You know, even the ship of Theseus is only a paradox insofar as you have a definition of identity that's characterized over space and one that's characterized over time. And so you could imagine the same thing, the notion of identity, and then two different ways of defining it or two different descriptions discriminators, and then looking at the same object, in this case, the ship of Theseus, and getting two different answers about, you know, which one is the ship as a result of which definition of identity you applied. And so you get this thing that's weirdly consistent up one level from, it, it consistently describes inconsistencies. <laughs> Cool. So I think we can probably continue. Okay. So yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, some protocol design work, and I think we have been both building our infrastructure, and and we're now actually um, kind of getting into the protocolization phase of this. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Um, but the things we're going to talk about here you know, as, as they are laid out is RIDs, assertions, relations, and identity. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of see how these, these all build off each other. Um, all right. Okay. So yeah, the, the most, the most kind of essential or basic part of this is the idea of a, of a reference identifier. Um, and so I think the the important distinction here that we that we laid out um, at the beginning is that this is um, there are many more references than there are 
addresses in, in any addressing system um, because the, the things that a reference can refer to include data like in addressing systems, but can be non-digital as well, right? They can be they can be a named abstract concept. They can be a place in the world. Um, quite literally, anything that you can refer to where that reference can be digitally represented, um, which is which is a very big space. And the the RID system or protocol um, aims to carve out a and make useful a a. a, a a large portion of that space. I doubt that we will get everything. That seems that seems unlikely, but it's 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 a way of both representing uh, reference to things and um, kind of providing the affordances of of referring to things, um, which is kind of like the you know the doing of and the result of of reference. You want to take this one, Luke? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way that we've kind of constructed these RIDs um, in the implementation sense is these two key components, which is the means of reference and then the reference itself. Um, so the means of reference is essentially the category um, of the thing we're referencing to, um, or another way to put it is how a reference refers. Um, so it establishes the bounds of the referent um, and then also informs the dereferencing and other available actions to objects that are referred to in that way. Um, and then importantly, the, the combination of the means of reference and the reference establish the uniqueness of an object. Um, and so that, that kind of becomes important when you have references, which might be the same, um, but are actually referring to different things under different contexts. Um, so for example, you could have a phone number, which is represented as, you know, 10 digits. Um, but maybe that 10 digits is also an ID inside of a database. Um, so those could have the exact same, uh, reference. Um, but since they are kind of being understood under, under different contexts, that's where the means of reference comes in and gives us the uniqueness between those two things. Um, so the reference itself is is the component, um, like the URL, the CID, or the name, um, which is telling us what we're actually referring to under that uh, means. Um, and then the final component of this is the actions. Um, and so when we kind of first start thinking about it, we sort of restricted this just to dereferencing, but we sort of expanded this to be a more general category. Um, but essentially the means of reference also also gives you what actions are defined um, on a given object. Um, and so we've sort of have this very broad definition of, of something being performed on or with the objects um, under a certain context. So a couple examples we have here are dereferencing, which is grabbing the data of the thing we're actually pointing to. Uh, transforming, which is sort of changing uh, one RID into another. Um, so maybe taking the reference and then applying some transformation to it. So um, it now creates a new RID under a different means. Um, and then direct uh, operations on an object itself, like creation or, or um, updating the, the data that's being stored. Um, so the next section here, we're going to talk about um, identity and uh, groupings again. Um, so in, in this protocol, we sort of have these uh, four different attributes. Um, so together, there's two, two sets of two, two pairs, and together they form four different unique um, types of relationships between objects. Um, so the first thing we have is the undirected versus directed. Um, so our undirected relationships are simply just a set of member objects. Um, so it's just a simple group. And then our directed uh, relation relationships are mappings from one set to another set. Um, and this can be from one to many, from many to one, one to one, or many to many. So it's pretty flexible. Um, and then finally, we have the other axis of this, which is relations versus assertions. Um, and so relations are, I guess, a little bit more agnostic. Um, they're simply uh, immutable uh, relationships that are either undirected or directed. Um, and you can just sort of create them, but they can't be changed after the fact, and they don't have um, the, the properties that assertions do. Um, and then as assertions are things that, say, a group or an agent within the system is asserting about objects within it. Um, so it has, I guess, more uh, kind of intention behind it. Um, so it has the added property of being mutable, governable, and, and temporal. 
and these three attributes kind of tie together. Um, so each assertion will have this complete historical record transaction chain, um, which shows all the mutations that take it from its kind of initial uh, state when it was created to its current version. Um, and then the governance is how we um, decide when those mutations are, are made. I can uh, <clears throat> speak on this a bit. So this is just a bit of a, a visualization to help drive kind of intuition about here. So we, we have the key up the top where um, objects are, oh, nice, yeah. I don't um, think it's gonna load. <laughs> <laughs> um, objects are blue here. Um, yeah, there we go. Nice. Okay, so objects are blue. We have these uh, green agents, and we have belief values, which, which I'll touch on. So in the middle here, we we have some examples of kind of quite trivial assertions, um, and I've intentionally uh, not named what these objects are. So there, there will be a little requirement to use your imagination here. But you can, for example, express that, like, you know, this group of things is part of this thing, or that or that this thing and that thing are the same, uh, or that these are descriptions of that, um, or that, you know, this is a better project name than that. Um, but you, you can also do this um, without without any objects in, in the relation, right? Just like, uh, or you could think of it as like a, a unary, or like there's, there's different ways to, to say it, but something like, we should eat pizza tonight. Um, no, no objects uh, outside of the the assertion were required there. And so, once once you can express or, or represent these assertions, um, you can then have from agents um, uh, an expression of of a belief value. So here we're using like a, a form of like a fuzzy predicate logic, which is to say that a, a belief value is is a, a bit like a truth value, like a, like a true or false. Um, but you can have a range in between, right? So you could, for example, have uh, a fifty percent confidence in something being true, um, and and actually, it's not just truth, right? But it's it's um, uh, like, for example, uh, whether we should eat pizza tonight. Um, you can think of that as like, how strongly do you believe in that being true? Um, but it might be more intuitive to just think of that as. How strongly do you believe that that is a thing that we should do? Um, and so, when you have these belief values, it, it gives you a, a few things, which I, I think are, are really important. Right? One is that you can look at the system from the perspective of, of a particular agent. So, from from Zagam's perspective, um, some things may be true in a way that they are not for David. Um, and then you can also take. Uh, multiple agents, um, and you can view things from the perspective of groups of agents, and there's you can divide those up any any way you want. So, for example, on the, on the right here, we have this imagined working group between Zargum and Kelsey, and so you could imagine um, aggregating their beliefs in different ways, like for example, just averaging them out, um, and that gives you yet another way to form a, a kind of view onto the system. Um, that is that is informed by the perspective of of agents, and then the the last point I'll make is that um, these agents don't have to be people. Um, they can also be, for example, uh, an LLM which is given a, a plain text version of an assertion and is asked to evaluate how how true it is, um, or or they could be some some much more explicit uh, piece of programming. Um, so, for example, the the kind of database or like the the, the back end of, of our system is is also an agent. Um, and so we can see that the things that are uh, being said kind of automatically as as stuff is is happening in the system, um, that these are not inherently true. It's something that the the system or or really like us as programmers building the system are uh, are encoding as 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 a belief value on an assertion. Yeah, and one thing yeah. I wanted to quickly add here is that uh, <clears throat> this construction here and, and a lot of the examples we're going to go through are sort of building these layers upon these uh, primitive relationships that we've identified. Um, so here we have these assertions and beliefs, um, but actually the agents themselves are also um, specific types of objects. Um, and the working group that we identified between Z and Kelsey um, is could itself be an assertion between 
the objects just where the objects happen to be agents. Um, and then finally, the, the beliefs themselves are also um, assertions. So you can think of those as being a, um, a, a directed assertion that's sort of mapping from the agent that has the belief uh, to another assertion um, with this kind of added metadata about the strength of, of that belief. Um, but we'll get more into that later. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can start with this one. So, as we've kind of expressed a little bit already, <clears throat> the way we're looking at identity is is in this kind of uh, social agreement sense, and structurally, it's 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 relational <clears throat> in the sense that we have two or more objects, and we're expressing this like sameness relation between those objects, um, uh, which is to say that th there is some way in which these are the same. Um, and what we mean by that, I think, will be illustrated more on the next slide. <clears throat> oh, slide after that. Uh, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. We can we can talk about this. Um, so, so this is kind of going a bit into the database representation for this project. Um, but all the objects that we've been talking about are stored um, in this graph database backend that we have here. Um, and so everything is either a node or a relationship between the nodes. Um, so this is kind of the resulting graph that emerged from the demo that I did um, about a month ago. Um, so if we kind of dig into it a little bit, we can uh, see some of the structures that we just talked about. Um, so first of all, we have these blue nodes here, which represent, um, I believe these are directed assertions. Um, so we have myself, Orion, and David here. Um, and these are actually assertions themselves. So they're groupings of objects referring to um, our specific like, user accounts on different platforms. Um, so I have like the GitHub and email and, and a Slack user. Um, and then we have these blue assertions in the middle, which are collections of HackMD documents. Um, and then finally, these, these pink nodes represent a, a belief assertions. Um, so you can see that there's this mapping from myself uh, to these uh, relevant documents here. So this kind of represents my belief value in this collection of documents. Cool. <clears throat> so one way that we can um, think of identity more formally here, and this is like expressed uh, in, in like logical form, um, and what this is really saying is <clears throat> that we have this this set of relata or like these this set of objects um, which are associated with this identity relation. Um, and then within this set, what we're saying is that there is some uh, sameness qualification that's or, or there is <clears throat> some some way in which these are the same. We have this difference qualification or, or some way in which these objects are different. And quite importantly, we have this uh, kind of compatibility um, that is ex basically saying that like the, the way they are the same and the way they are different uh, are not in contradiction with, with one another, right? So as an example, um, you could say that, you know, these two things are the same concept, but different, uh, different descriptions say or different articulations of the same concept um and then between uh same concept and different articulation we can we can say that that these that these two are, are compatible um whereas if we were to say that these two these two objects are the same concept but they are a different idea um it's not entirely clear cut, but I, th I think for most people that would kind of raise a kind of red flag because at least at the intuitive level, um, something that is the same concept cannot be a different idea, right? These two things are kind of tied together. And so that creates this this, this contradiction, right? Like a, a, a way in which you're saying things are different that, that doesn't seem to um, conform with the way that they're, they are the same. Um, and so this can be like socially mediated, which is which is mostly what we lean on on now, right? So this is kind of being informally evaluated by agents in the system. But 
you can also um, you can also express this um, in much more formal ways if the context allows for it, or in more automated ways like with the help of, of LLMs and textual representations. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is one way of expressing it more formally. And um, to your question earlier, Jamshid, um, one uh, kind of equivalence class that, that that you could that you could look at here is the class of things that have the the exact same sameness qualification and difference qualification. Um, so, for example, um, actually, may, maybe I won't do an example. This would be a, a thing to do to do later. Um, it would be a bit too verbose. But you you can imagine that if if uh, you know if A and B are the same are both uh, are the same and 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 different in in the same way. That's that's a confusing sentence. Oh, I'll rephrase that. If a and B have the same sameness and difference qualifications, um, and B and C have the same sameness and difference qualifications, um, and you these relations are expressed independently, then you can imagine like establishing um, a particular kind of equivalence class there. Um, however, if if you have if A and B are the same, uh, if A and B have one sameness qualification and B and C have that same same as qualification, um, but the difference qualification is different. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy in these words, I feel like. Um, then it it doesn't necessarily follow that that A and C um, are equivalent because the the, the 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 kind of the difference on on one side might might violate um, the sameness on the other. Um, I think this would be easier to articulate visually, but but hopefully that that um, points to your. I have a, a thought. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, it's just that I think what's happening here is that there might be a kind of, there's sort of a custom kind of graph algebra thing here. And I, I think it might actually be worth pulling out, not now, but like, Jamshid, you'd be a great person to, to have this discussion with. But like, can we take this, you know, notion of um, kind of, again, I guess, essentially an algebra, I'm not even sure if it's an algebra, but like some mathematical system that has, you know, basically nodes and edges and edge types of sameness and difference and like construct a kind of almost like a graph logic um, and like play with it a little bit and see what other, ma what, maybe what other kinds of mathematical things are similar. <laughs> Ironically, if we make a mathematical system and then express a sameness and difference qualification about it and other mathematical systems is a little bit humorous as I'm saying this out loud. But I actually genuinely believe that there's something interesting in this sort of, I'll call it an abstract ontology. And what we haven't done yet is written it down sufficiently formally mathematically to ask whether this is a new mathematical object or not. Yeah, it's very helpful. And I guess it's the, the example is that, that you that you raised, Ryan, is also really helpful to kind of articulate the the way with, in which, and I'll, I'll say this, within the context of a single, let's call it a universal compatibility mapping, that you can get these distinctions to be to be made between identi uh, identical and not identical, and therefore the partition of the set into equivalence classes. But I think even more fundamental, and this maybe gets to what Zarga was talking about for the the representation, is how you can encapsulate different people's beliefs, or perspectives, or views, or facets with different compatibility mappings, and still end up with equivalence classes that everybody agrees upon or being the same even if they have different S and D, uh, sameness and difference qualifications. So what so I'm wondering if there's a degree of freedom also in that, uh, in that mapping. What I'm thinking, Jamshid, is that there might be something like a topological space made up of open sets, which themselves are locally consistent. So you have this big universe of not necessarily consistent things, but in, for any particular you know, region, you could describe basically a neighborhood that is in fact locally logically consistent and then you could have like broader um you know space made up of you know the over all of these partially overlapping locally logically consistent regions which has the flavor of a topological space but it's still ultimately derived from some sort of like you know logic graph system Nice. Yeah. And then there, the transformation between the different locally consistent spaces would be some method of 
understanding each other's facets or in, in, in some of our earlier work, what we would call maybe context transforms. So we would change my context to your trans, your, your context. If I see it from your point of view, then I can say, oh yeah, your local representation is compatible internally, even if it's incompatible with mine. You know, yeah. I was about to ask if there's a mathematical representation of negotiation, and I think you just gave it. That could be to the degree to which you have overlap and the degree to which you can assert that the mapping that is con that is allowing you to walk from one internally consistent representation to the other has certain properties. And maybe a few of them would be like using things like from manifolds where we can kind of find the equivalence of of a diffeomorphism, something that can allow you to move back and forth without like corrupting the uh, the, the way that people are seeing things. Maybe that's one way to, to look at negotiation. I think you could layer over that. I think what you're describing is sort of necessary at the level of language or communication in the negotiation, but then conditioned on what is effectively a, a communication protocol, the ability to share meaning, even with this inconsistency potentially present, you then have something like each actor within the negotiation has a potentially private um, constraint space, so a, fee, a constraint satisfaction problem, the set of things they're willing to do at all, which if it's not intersecting, then there's really nothing that you could agree to together. If it's if it's perceived as intersecting, then you have some sort of, you know, a joint constraint satisfaction problem, which is still a constraint satisfaction problem. And then, you know, one or both of the actors might have utility functions over the their particular decision variables. And then ultimately negotiation is some sort of protocol for using your communication capabilities to find, you know, points in the joint constraint satisfaction problem and then essentially resolve to one of them. Yeah, I I would definitely love to to um to continue that that line of thinking. I think it'd be great to potentially set up a call around that. Yeah, and I maybe um, I would leave off by saying then that coming back to the other work on the um the kind of net the the KMS slash LLM work is that like it could get to a place that if our IDs and these notions of identity and communication are understandable, it would in fact be possible to train agents to effectively negotiate as constraint satisfaction, as joint constraint satisfaction. But we have to have the language. If you don't have the language to communicate between two otherwise or potentially inconsistent models of the world, you can't actually negotiate effectively. Yeah, that's definitely a, a prospect I've I've thought about a fair bit, and and I think you're right that the um, the prerequisite there is is the language um, and the ability to represent that textually, um, and once you have that, then you can see how well LLMs can be can be used for that kind of purpose. Um, it also happens that that last slide was right before a pause, so if there are any um questions around some of this kind of protocol design work and and the stuff in this last section um now's a good time for that you you had a slide that that had object slash relata ah uh, yeah is that a standard sort of word is yeah in it, yeah it's 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 the like Relata are just the the kind of the members of a of a relationship um, used used mostly in contexts where you're kind of uh, where 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 relations have some some primacy in the the kind of the model of of thinking and and reasoning that you're using. Um, so you see it a fair bit in uh, parts of philosophy or even in like um, early work on database design and and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> So it just kind of emphasizes the that the that the objects that exist in the context of of some relation. Yeah, it is it. I mean, the 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 model in my head is that 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 and 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 I think you know we, we call it knowledge um, organization infrastructure. Um, so. Is there 
a parallel between Rolada and knowledge? Um, I I think it's more it's more pointing to the 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 structure. So like a, a relata is really just like one or more objects between which like a relation is said to to hold, or or, or it's one or more group of of related things. Mm -hmm. Um, may, maybe there is a connection there to to knowledge. Um. Yeah, there is there is in my head. I'm trying to try, trying to figure out whether it's like shared <laughs> negotiating terms here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any more uh, thoughts? Or are we good to move on? All right. So now that we've kind of gone through the conceptual and, and uh, protocol design, we're going to move into the actual infrastructure um, for the system that we've built. Um, so there's this is kind of a big diagram showing all the different components that we've been talking about. Um, but I'll just briefly touch on uh, these three kind of components at the bottom here. Um, so going back to our kind of uh, design motivations for this um a big a big part of the system design is kind of observing uh, the world as it is and pointing to it rather than trying to replicate it um, or building like our own kind of map um so this is where this idea of a sensor array comes in um, where we're kind of observing uh, information and digital objects that we can then refer to within our system through like a variety of platforms um like slack or hackmd um and then we have all these interfaces here on the left. Um, right now, it's pretty limited to just our, our web and Slack interface. Um, but we do have this API that lets us, um, hopefully in the future, connect to more platforms and interfaces up to it. Um, and then finally, we have the direct Python interface, um, which is how we can sort of directly import and, and build these structures within the system um, and build up support for new means of reference, new actions for those means of references which then kind of uh, cascades through the whole system and, and makes all those accessible via the API. Is there anything you wanted to add, Orion, before we move on to the, the layering? Um, yeah, I can probably add a, a couple of things here. So one is to say that we're kind of in the process of protocolization here. And so I think the the hope is that like the all of the essentials are going to be sufficiently encoded in the protocols so that the API you get on top of that um, essentially becomes uh, a, a a particular interface to these protocols that you could think of as like the boundary between an organization or some context um, and, and this underlying set of protocols. Um, <clears throat> at the top in this diagram, um, the, what that's trying to illustrate is that there are, there are different ways that we can kind of view this collection of objects um, so we can view it as as hypergraphs or, or or as graphs um we can view at least the the textual objects as uh, as as vector embeddings as like a point in in space um, which is useful for LLM stuff which we will touch on later um we can look at it as search indices for plain text search that kind of stuff and of course we can just um uh, look at it as just a collection of of objects without any additional structure. And then the the last thing I'll say is um, that at least in this context of of kind of how the system as a whole functions in relation to RIDs and and these protocols, is that you could think of RIDs as like providing uh, a kind of lens onto some local computational context. Um, so within block science, you know, we use a bunch of different tools and platforms and stuff like that. And so RID is a kind of this intermediary where you can uh, you can just observe a, a local set of systems and notice when new objects come into existence, um, and and that's ultimately what RIDs really do, um, which seems very mundane, but I think that it's 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 actually kind of mundane by design, which is that RIDs just establish that something exists and and provides a, a means to refer to it. 
um, but it really doesn't say anything about how they should be structured, how they should be used, what they are, and and so on. Um, and and the the reason why I think that kind of mundanity is is uh, useful is that like being able to refer to something something that it, you know and establishing the existence of of an object in the first place is really like the first precondition of any further um kind of representation or expression or like organization that you want to do kind of with or um, among those those objects um and so by by not doing anything else on top of that um that really helps a lot uh towards kind of providing uh a way of doing things more pluralistically right because we, we don't say that things should form into like hierarchies or or, or, or even hypergraphs right like we, we lean quite heavily on this hypergraph model um but that's not in the rids that's something that we've added on top that we see as beneficial to block science specifically um yeah i think that's that's yeah. all i got for now i think that's a, that's a really good segue into the next section actually um so so the way we build up this infrastructure is in kind of this layered i guess i'll call it a cake um so so at the at the top or i guess at the bottom the um the the base of it we have these objects um so this is kind of like the fundamental building block for everything and these are the the rid based digital objects that we kind of discussed earlier um and so they they share some basic properties the the format of the means of reference plus reference um and then they have actions associated with them um, and so actually everything in the system is it's is a type of object that kind of gets more and more specific and has its own sort of special properties or actions associated with it. Um, so the next layer, we have the assertions and relations, um, which are the relationships between the objects that we have defined. Um, but let me see if I can go back to that previous uh, picture here. You'll notice that the assertions themselves are also objects within the system. Um, so while there's like these these edges which represent what those assertions actually are, um, they are still represented by a node, and those those um, edges are special actions that we have defined for that type of object. Um, so an assertion will have an action to add a new object to its set, um, or to say update some of the metadata about it, um, but it can still be referred to in the exact same way as any other object in the system. So it still has that same means of reference plus reference um, format for, for the string ad identifier. Um, so, and then the next layer up, we have kind of these these more specific and more, um, more tailored uh, types of objects. So we have these governance nodes, um, which can attach to assertions to then um, decide which agents are allowed to kind of make changes and how those changes are are propagated um, to the the mutations that the that the assertion makes. Um, we we have agents themselves, which are um, as we kind of mentioned briefly, are, are groupings of objects which refer to say user accounts on on a different plat on on various platforms. And then we have beliefs, which are special special types of assertions, which are mappings from agents to other assertions. Um, and so that's where some of this, um, the, the fact that all these things are objects is really useful because we can actually group any of these things together and treat them exactly the same, um, which lets us have assertions of assertions or um, belief values from agents to a governance structure, um, which lets us have these really expressive and, and interesting um, relationships emerge between these like huge, huge variety of, of nodes. Would you just as an example, would you say that something like a concept like legitimacy might be understood as, um, let's say, at an individual as an individual agent or as an agent making an assertion about a governance structure would be the kind of thing that like legitimacy is, or maybe even a larger, you know, quote unquote working group or quote you know an assemblage of agents that is in a sense an agent um, having a collective assertion over mm -hmm. a governance structure is actually possibly the way to think about some of these nebulous and hard to pin down concepts. Because once you have this sort of meta ontology for describing relations, it might become clearer that like, 
this governance structure is considered legitimate by this group of stakeholders, but isn't considered legitimate right. by this other group of stakeholders, which goes back to our earlier discussion about, you know, inconsistencies, where, yeah, you know, yeah. I think legitimacy is one of the hardest concepts to unpack in non, at least in non-formal reasoning, in part because it has a, a built-in paradox, which is, you often simultaneously have groups of agents who view a particular structure as legitimate where others simultaneously don't. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And and this kind of gets into the plurality, kind of traverses through all these layers at once. So you could totally represent um, legitimacy as a collection of beliefs from a bunch of individual agents on a, a, you know, a governance node, or like you said, a you know a group of agents expressing a single belief value as a group on the governance um uh, on the governance node but but the other thing is like that very structure itself is also a decision um <laughs> so for better or for worse like all these things um can be represented in different ways so someone could actually make their own alternative belief um object which acts you know differently maybe it's you know restricted it it it, it doesn't work for agents maybe only uh, groups of agents can make this type of belief. Um, or maybe instead of having individual beliefs from one agent to, uh, say, one assertion, it's like a, you know, one to many relation. So even the way that we're we're building these sort of primitive structures is also sort of a, a decision we're making that, you know, someone could easily decide to do it to do it a different way. Um, and that kind of leads into the next section here, which is the the object and platform support. Um, so this is just a list of all of the means of reference that we have in the system right now. Um, and something you'll notice is that everything I talked about is a, is, is a means of reference. Um, so we've kind of bootstrapped the entire system using the RID system. Um, so actually only at the end here, we have the URLs, HackMD, and Slack, which is like, those are kind of the, ob the digital objects that we've been talking about as sort of more typical examples of sort of real data that we're pointing to. Uh, but actually everything that we've been talking about today, all of the all the primitive types of relationships, all of the kind of higher level stuff to deal with governance and, and users, all of that are types of objects, uh, specifically means of reference within our, the RID system. Um, and so the amazing thing about this is that you can add as many new types of objects and means of reference as you want to. Um, so there's even pluralism in how the system itself is structured. Um, and you know you can take an existing structure like a um, a directed assertion and sort of inherit from that and create a new object which is you know more narrow or or more tightly defined, which is exactly what our uh, our our belief uh, values are. They're they're inheriting from the directed assertion. Um, so Luke, your your comment about sorry to just enter like about no how someone could construct different things, you know, it kind of makes me realize that the kind of protocol that you're creating is a kind of ontology protocol, in particular, an implementable one, and ideally one that allows those ontologies to interoperate with each other, even when mm -hmm. they are not consistent with each other. But from a, like a broad perspective, like what you're describing is that which you would use to define and implement an ontology, such that that local ontology is actually local and can in fact interact with another instance of an ontology even if they're not consistent with each other yeah yeah exactly so i think this kind of rid system is almost at the level of something like http where it just sort of defines how you can communicate um so it like it sets up the structure for more complex objects which have these tighter tighter defined actions um, which refer to more specific things um, and, you know, I think realistically, when we start spinning up more instances of these, we're going to, you know, agree on a lot of the base level things. So probably all of these objects here are going to be supported by most other, you know, instances of like a, a KOI system. Um, but the important thing is like, that's a decision. So like, someone could literally just get rid of everything, like they don't want any of this, but they're still using the same RID system. Uh, they just have these, these different types of means of references that are defined. Um, and maybe that connects up to the discussion you're having earlier about like, how you can communicate and like change context. Um, Cause a lot of the interoperability is gonna be dependent on how much overlap there is between the types of objects that you're kind of using and representing within your system. I think you you basically just said it there, but before we jump into interfaces, if we go back two slides, um, that like what, 
what gives that base layer of of kind of not quite interoperability but like gives you the preconditions for that is this kind of first layer of like we have objects we can refer to them if whether they're in our system or in someone else's um and then the stuff on top is is potentially very local kind of ontologizing that we're doing and to your point a different organization could choose to to not have assertions or relations or these structures if, if they wanted to do something very different they can um, but by kind of sharing this, uh, having this kind of shared uh, reference space with all these objects in it, um, that allows us to, um, to for example, refer to these uh, kind of alien uh, kinds of objects in a different system and say things about them ourselves, even if we don't have the same structures or affordances um, or, or local ontology. Um, and yeah, to the extent that that, a kind of ontology or these structures or representations overlap we can have uh, richer kinds of interoperability and and on top of that if we have ways of kind of translating uh for example between say assertions and some other constructs that a different organization made maybe we discovered that we can actually have a, a kind of robust translation between them and that gives us yet another way to kind of build these um these bridges Yeah, and just one more thing that we haven't quite touched on is um, we haven't really discussed how like these protocols are kind of agreed upon um, because we have this pluralistic view. There could also be the possibility of two organizations implementing the same sort of means of reference in a different way. Um, maybe they have different actions or even define the actions differently for the same exact um, object, which has the exact same RID. So that could create some conflict. Um, and I think this is kind of out of the scope of the presentation here, but one potential solution to that is bootstrapping that even further within the system and having these pluralistic views be able to directly represent the, the RID system itself. Um, and so we could come to a consensus about what um, this means of reference means and what actions should be associated with it within the RID system itself, which is, which is kind of cool. So um, yeah, we'll just move on to the... I think it's the second to last section here, but this is our, our interfaces. Um, Orion, do you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah, so I think this will overall be quite brief. So as in the uh, the diagram that kind of showed the, the architecture um, on the left, we have several different interfaces. Well, we have, we have two really and the possibility to produce more. One is this uh, new web interface, which is a much prettier, well-developed form of kind of what we had before with a, with a bunch more affordances. Um, so we can, you know, search objects, we can do uh, curation, we can interact with the LLM system and, and all of that. Um, so we have, yeah, this web interface is one. And then next we have uh, LLMs and kind of conversational um interfaces to to llm systems um this is the one that's on the on the website right now um and then we also if you go to the right one more time we have a, a slack based llm interface it's interfacing with the same system and we're in the process of kind of uh reviving this system in a in a more robust form with a uh, project goldfish cool so this is really the the last slide um, and we can kind of open it up with the, the rest of the time that we have um but yeah we are starting a collaboration with with metagov to start sharing some of this infrastructure um we're in the process of protocolizing a lot of the design work um and as part of that kind of moving these systems towards open source kind of instantiable shareable uh, systems that other organizations and other people can can deploy and use. Um, and I think, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it so looks like we, we have about 15 minutes for a discussion. Yeah. I mean, I always have plenty of thoughts, but I want to kind of defer the floor to some other folks. <laughs>
Well, then maybe I'll try to kick off the discussion. And I'm going to point this kind of at the group. Um, like when we kind of go through this very technical research that is what I would call like low level making systems that are more expressive, um, we at least initially add a massive amount of complexity to projects that leverage these highly expressive systems. And then we effectively have to layer up back towards easy UX. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious from the broader group's perspective, you know, as we dug down and kind of unlocked some of this complexity in order to support, in literally support inconsistencies and to make systems that can communicate with each other, even across differences in, in world model and differences in ontologies, not just beliefs over facts within those ontologies, that, that comes at a huge like I guess formal complexity cost. And I'm yeah, what I what I'm kind of gesturing at to the broader group is like, how do we go about assimilating, preserving that expressivity, but assimilating it back up to things that are usable? Like what is a usable application um that has this in its internals look like to um to any of you guys? All right, so just for reference, like I think it would be really cool to make even relatively simple local negotiation things like we were discussing earlier. The idea that we have um, a sufficiently overlapping ontology, even if it's otherwise inconsistent, to identify or even create new objects through the interchange between two such um, like localities or two such systems that, um, you know, a thing that I'm already really interested in is given the genuine expressivity, like could a conversation between two instances actually manifest as new objects within their local things where they actually build some of the, the missing links that they need in order to communicate clearly. I get that's not really like a, um, concrete application yet, but I, I think from a testing paradigm, like if we had, you know, instances of these things running and again, back to our discussion about the MetaGov collaboration, when I think about interoperability and communication across difference, the thing that comes to mind is, can the kind of discourse or the interaction between two instances be thought of as, um, or even equipped with the tooling to identify and create new objects as a result of the conversation. In effect, the human experience of meeting a person that you can't quite communicate with and doing this kind of like back and forth and you're like, build a little node that's like, oh, I now have a node, which is, this is what that person thinks this word means. And then I can use it in the context of talking to that person without shifting to a, I think that word means this thing. Right. Like that's the kind of thing that I find really incredible about this way of thinking. And I'm gesturing at how do we like, you know, develop things, test things, like build things that actually materially benefit from this kind of meta ontology that we're discussing. I mean, I've, I've got a, a, a fairly, you know, frequently stated goal of this. Um, as being sort of the the equivalent auto automation tool for knowledge workers that um, we've already developed for data and information workers, um, which basically boils down to what you just said. Um, we we have we we are able to to sort of generate factual information at 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 at, at speed and at volume. Um, but the kind of negotiation that you mentioned is always revolves people sitting around a table or talking on telephone, but it's, it, it is not automated. It, it's people doing what people have always done, but they're being fed through these um, sort of information pipes that are extremely automated. Um, so you know, there, there's there is a, a, a essentially the knowledge part of working is perceived as a bottleneck because it like is. Um, so it, can that bottleneck be alleviated? Um, and can I, the pressure taken off and and a balanced system arise? So David, I think one thing that 
is very possible given my observations of humans and new technologies. We're going to start automating in this. In fact, I think people are already kind of starting to do it with the way that LLMs have been used to help produce, even if it's initial recommendations, those recommendations tend to undergird actions. And, and so some of this step in the, I think of it just as decision-making processes, how do groups come to consensus and ultimately decide to act on something um, is already starting to transition into an increasingly automated paradigm. But what's missing is a way of understanding what the heck it's actually doing and why and how. Um, and I think having this kind of, you know, meta ontology, you know, ontological protocol is a way that makes it a little more possible to I guess, not do all of this in a model free way. Like, you know, there's always this tension between very structured models where you say, you know, exactly an expert system, check this box, check that box. It's totally predefined and things that are more data driven at the other extreme. And I view this way of reasoning about identity as a way of putting some of the structure back in, some of the legibility back in, some of the governability back in to these systems so that we have a better sense of, um, what I guess maybe how we program these systems, how we how we as humans express objectives and constraints within our local ontologies, how some other humans express objectives and constraints within their local ontologies. And insofar as those systems engage in some sort of negotiation where they build references and maps between their concepts through discourse and then ultimately attempt to solve the joint um, constraint satisfaction problem where each is locally uh, optimizing for the objectives that their local system has sort of imbued in them is a far more legible, far more, I guess, trustworthy in the sense. I mean, not just in the sense of um, uh, I guess we, we talk about the difference between confidence and trust, I guess. Like I say trustworthy as opposed to confidence because there ends up being a, I teach this thing how to be my agent and then I have to trust it to exercise those degrees of freedom in a way that is um, consistent with my um, asks of it, even if I can't totally understand how it came to that decision. Um, I guess, yeah, you know, there's a question of whether that's trust or confidence, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm gesturing at this expectation that humans will continue to rapidly automate this, this knowledge work and that the extent to which this knowledge work produces, you know, really degenerate effects as it is automated versus the extent to which we can kind of build relations to it that are healthy may depend on the existence of these kinds of protocols. Yeah, I think I think that's true. But to, to operationalize that, some um, this as you said, this this is the form. You know, the LLM is 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 the is is the sort of the layer on top. Um, it works now, but it's kind of impenetrable. You, you, nobody on it's black box. With with the the architecture that that Luke and Orion just talked about. Are are effectively the 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 a, a a building blocks that allow explanation to happen, and in that sense, I think the, what it brings to the table is not only can you compose, uh, it, it's you know, ideas and generate a response, but you're able to some extent to reverse the process and from the response, re-expose sort of the the pieces that were put together to bring it up and and the way that that affects negotiation in my head is that you know an, or, an organization can can work within itself to come up with a sort of a perfect representation of what it wants and then as opposed to you know another organization that has another one of these perfect representations they're just spheres. They're, they're billiard balls that knock 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 against each other. Whereas what what you really need is is is, is something that's that it's able to get into the internal structure, like clay or I don't know, sand or whatever, that that can then be rearranged in, in yet another form. And th this is this is the infrastructure that allows that to happen. I really like the way that you put that and. I think one of my my hopes for this, and we kind of talked about about it's being more explainable, is that 
it's going to kind of be an alternative to the sort of black box AI solutions to to knowledge management. Um, and I, I think Zargon, the point you raised about this being sort of an ontology protocol is also interesting um, because it's almost like a layer down from where most protocols are. Uh, so if you take the example of like HTTP, it's almost like we're building this, this infrastructure which lets us define different actions. Um, so HTTP has like these set things like get, put, delete, stuff like that. Um, but we're, we're letting each organization define those actions for themselves. And so I think one interesting outcome of this could be that you have this more intentional uh, design and decision-making of how organizations like communicate and understand their own knowledge. Um, and especially when it comes to how they communicate and negotiate with each other, you could see that kind of building up in sort of this shared representation of, of how you understand each other's knowledge, um, almost like building up a, a very specific language just for this exchange between these two uh, different groups of people. Yeah, totally. Um, it's interesting as we talk about it, you know, I sometimes bias my reasoning about as machine to machine negotiation or machine to machine communication, and then eventually negotiation. But there's a, a lot of room for us to also think about how this makes human to machine um, discussion and negotiation a little bit more um like I guess legible or at least something we can reason about more effectively. And if you back propagate it enough, it also provides us a lens for reasoning about human to human communication, especially across difference, which is itself already very challenging, right? And you encounter someone with a sufficiently different ontological or ideological foundation um, or expertise or background communicating um, can actually be very difficult, um, especially if you're not grounded in a shared context that you can bootstrap off, which itself manifests as a local overlapping ontology created through some shared experience in life. So it, it even gives us an explanation for why um, putting two people who are otherwise very different in their experiences and ideologies into a physical world context together and giving them some time will result in a non-trivial overlap in their ontologies, which itself can seed discussions that allow them to build mappings and ultimately collaborate or, or communicate, communicate and eventually collaborate more effectively, where if they're just in isolated regions of the ontology verse, they can't actually communicate at all. Um, and anyway, I just think it's actually kind of cool to see this um, through that lens too. All right, so it looks like we're um, at time here. Um, I don't I don't think I actually have anything to add. Some of the things that, that I wanted to say um, were said there. I, I guess the, the last thing um, is that I think my hope for this system, or at least a part of it, is that it it kind of has a trajectory that leads away from kind of platforms and software and that these affordances like like uh, kind of provisioning reference via RIDs or, or other mechanisms um, can over time become uh, more baked into the kind of computational substrate, if you will, or just a, a kind of more general shared infrastructure that people kind of have, have available to them um, by default. Um, I think that'll take a long time, but I'm I'm excited uh, to see that trajectory unfold. Well, let's uh, just say thank you. And yeah, anybody want to clap? I'm going to clap. This is awesome, guys. Great project, great progress, great presentation. Thank you. And thanks for all the, the comments and feedback. Yeah, likewise. Uh, it was great. This was, thanks, uh, this was great. Thanks. Thank you.